Welcome to Meeple Mentor. I'm Jared and we're about to play Archipelago. Let's take a look. I'll show you how. Feel free to pause the video as needed to follow along with your copy of the game. For your convenience, I've added timestamps in the description to the different sections of the tutorial. Make sure to subscribe and hit the notification bell below the video so you don't miss any of my latest content. The game of Archipelago takes place between 1492 and the discovery of America and 1797 when Tahiti was colonized. This is the age of discovery, known for intense European exploration and colonization. Each player represents an explorer and his team, sent by a European nation to discover, colonize, and exploit islands. The mission is peace. Provide for the needs of the local population while exporting commercial goods back to Europe. If the natives and their land are not fairly treated, they will rebel. The rebellion could lead to a war for independence, so players must work together to find a balance between serving and respecting the islands and profiting and industrializing the area. Additionally, one player could be a separatist or pacifist, which may complicate the mutual balance players are striving for. Archipelago is not a traditional cooperative game, but one that encourages a basic amount of respect for the actions you take. Players must, at this basic level, manage the native population's unrest. If the natives trigger a rebellion, the game ends prematurely and everyone loses. If any player was secretly a separatist, only they win at this point. Each player begins the game with a secret objective card which will determine a possible end game trigger and how players can earn victory points. Each objective card's victory point criteria will score at the end of the game, but you will only know your own criteria. Keep an eye out for what others are doing, as it could be them trying to set up points for the end of the game. When the game end is triggered for someone's objective card, all objective cards are revealed, and victory points are awarded to all players based on each objective card. The player with the most victory points is the grand winner. To set up, first determine how many people are playing. If less than five players, place the two to four player side of the action wheel face up. If five players, flip it over. You'll see that the purple color is reserved for the fifth player. Next, separate the colored cubes, which represent the different resources you'll be collecting during the game. Use the box's insert and place the cubes in these six slots as shown. Keep them in this arrangement as it will help gameplay go smoothly later. The insert will also hold other items during gameplay, such as the explorer tokens, money, evolution cards, and building tiles. Create three stacks of eight explorer tokens and put them in the slots here. Now separate the money tokens into the five florin and one florin denominations and place them here. The gold color represents five florins, silver is one florin. This is the evolution card deck. Make sure they're all facing the same way, regardless of the icon shown. Shuffle it carefully and place it in the insert here. You can use the space in the insert for the building chits. Set the box in this orientation and place the evolution card track underneath, leaving room for cards to sit above the track. Now deal five evolution cards to the positions here, face up. The orientation of the card should be in the upright position. The orientation of the cards is very important because later they'll end up rotating and will change their prices to purchase them. Set out the domestic market, export market, colony stability, and available worker boards like this. Place a cube of the given resource for each of the resource sections in the top left corner on the domestic market. Nothing starts on the export market. Each time you add a cube on the board, it's always placed from the top to bottom and left to right on the open spots. Depending on the row the cubes are in, the price will be different, shown on the left. On the right of the row shows other effects that will happen later. Place the white and black meeple on these spots of the colony stability board. The white meeple will represent the population of all the colonists. The black meeple represents the rebellion of the natives. Place the gray meeple on the available workers board. This meeple shows the number of available workers from the native population. All of these meeples start at zero. Each player should take all the meeples and pieces of the color of their choice along with the privacy screen. You'll have people, ships, turn order track marker, and action discs. 
Many actions in the game are done by placing these action discs. Give each player 10 florins, which is the currency. Players should keep their money and resources secret behind their privacy screen throughout the game. Randomly determine the first turn's player order. I recommend to take everyone's turn marker and shuffle them up, then drop one at a time to determine the random order. Place the tokens on the turn track board next to the number of their turn position. Shuffle the green trend cards and draw one to place face up for everyone to see. This card shows what the victory point criteria are for this game. This is one way players can gain points at the end of the game. Now separate the objective cards with the pocket watch on the backs. There should be three stacks of cards for a short game, medium game, and long game. Everyone should decide if they want a short, medium, or long game and shuffle that deck. Deal one card to each player. This will be a secret card that only that player can see during the game. The cards have a top and bottom half. The top part shows the specific conditions that will trigger the end of the game. Since it's a secret card, only you know that specific end-game condition. The bottom half of the card is additional victory point criteria. When the game ends, regardless of whose end-game condition was triggered, all of the victory point criteria is scored for all players. Descriptions of each objective card is shown on the back page of the rulebook, so make sure to identify which one you have and what it does. Then just pass it to the next player so everyone knows exactly what their card means. The game starts with everyone's ship on the open ocean tile. Place it in the center of the board with space for expanding outward. Each player places one of their ships on this tile to start the game. Shuffle all the rest of the map hex tiles and deal three to each player. As long as they're able to play one of the three received, they may place them in player order adjacent to the open ocean tile. The map tiles always have to make logical sense. Water matching water, land matching land, and mountain to mountain. After the player places their map tile, they move their ship to that tile, sitting on the water. Don't cover up any of the circular resource icons that may appear. The fish icons in the water are a resource, for example. Then the player places two of their meeples onto the land, also careful not to cover up any resource icons. The player will get to take two resources that are shown on that tile. One of them you will keep and put behind your player screen. The other will go onto the domestic market board. If any tiles placed have huts on them, move the available worker meeple that many spaces on the available worker board. As a general rule, each map tile has five things on it. If you see three resource icons, then you know there are two huts on that map. Since we all place two of our meeples out on the map, move the white meeple on the colony stability board to the total number of placed meeples this game. So in a three-player game, the white meeple will be moved to six. Unused map tiles from setup should all be returned to the general stack of map tiles. Shuffle them all again and place them in the insert. Each round is made up of six phases. An overview of each phase is shown in the center of your privacy screen. Disengagement is the first phase of the round. You can skip this during the first round of the game. In future rounds, you may have meeples standing on different resource icons or buildings. Those are considered engaged and occupied. Those meeples have already done their actions and can't do anything else. During the disengagement phase, however, they may all come off the icons to be ready to be used again this round. In addition, if you have any evolution cards in front of you that are tapped, they will become untapped now. If there are meeples laying down, they are considered rebels. During disengagement, they will stand back up and are no longer rebels. After disengagement, everyone gets to bid money to be able to choose the turn order. Everyone secretly puts money in their hand and closes their fist. Players may also choose to bid nothing, since whatever money they bid is lost, no matter if they won or lost. Everybody puts their closed fists in the middle to show they're ready. Then everyone reveals how much money they bid. The winner will get to decide the player order. It's very good to go first in this game. There are a lot of negotiations that can happen in the game at this point. Other players may want to offer trades, money, or other deals so they'll get a better placement in the turn order. People can offer resources, money, or make promises. On the turn track board, the winner should rearrange the player turn markers in the desired turn order. Next comes population effects. 
Looking at the four boards, check to see where resources are in the import and export markets. Look at the icons to the right of the lowest row of each resource area that has resource cubes on it. In this case, where the resources have filled to this row, you can see to the right has this symbol meaning add an available worker. So just move the gray available worker meeple to the next number on its track. When someone goes to recruit or hire a worker, they would pay less as the gray meeple goes down in rows. The cost to hire is shown on the left. If any icons show a plus sign next to the rebellion icon, then you move that black meeple forward on the rebellion track based on how many icons are shown. After doing the population effects, move on to the balance of the archipelago phase. Take a look at the top card on the evolution card deck. If either top or bottom section is red, ignore that section in this phase. The top half refers to the domestic market. The bottom half refers to the export market. Resolve domestic crises first, then export crises. During a crisis, first all meeples lay down flat. In order to stand them back up again, someone must pay. Going in player order, each person has the opportunity to stand up meeples by paying what's required. In this case, any player may pay one fish resource to stand up five meeples. They don't have to be your own. Players may want to negotiate again in order for the paying player to stand up someone else's meeples. If the resource required is found in the domestic market, you may take one of them at no additional cost. You can then stand up meeples up to the number shown. You'll want to stand up your meeples for two reasons. First, if they're stood up, they can be used this round. Second, laying down meeples will increase the rebellion track possibly bringing an early end to the game. An export crisis may also be triggered based on what's on the bottom half of the card. Resolve that next. In this case, the rebellion track will go down by two for every temple built. Again, if there's a red threat on the card, you ignore it. You'll resolve that later. The main part of the game is the actions phase, where players take turns doing one action at a time. Look at the action wheel for most of the available actions you can do. You'll start the game with three action discs. It's possible to gain up to two more action discs, but I'll explain more about that later. Around the action wheel board, there are six action spaces that allow you to collect resources from the map. Place a disc here to collect fish, pineapple, wood, steel, stone, and cows. There's no limit to how many discs that can be placed there. When you take a resource collection action, all of your meeples on the map that could occupy an empty resource icon space for that kind may do so under that one action. For example, when you decide to take the action of collecting the cow resource. You have your two meeples on this tile which has the cow resource shown twice. Each of your meeples can move on to them to engage them. For each resource you engage like this, you gain one resource cube from the supply. All your meeples across the whole map can engage the resource type like this, if able. This action is the transaction space. Placing a disc here allows you to do one buy or sell action on the market boards. To sell, you can place one of your resource cubes on the next open spot of either of the market boards and collect money for it or you could buy one resource from the market, paying the cost shown next to the resource. This is the recruit workers space. If there's at least one on the available workers track, you can pay the cost shown on the row to gain somebody to join your cause. Gameplay wise, you get to add another one of your meeples to the map. It must be placed on a tile where you already have your pieces. Players are always limited to three of their own meeples per map tile. When someone places a new meeple on the map, move the white population meeple marker up one. There's another way to gain a worker via the reproduction space. Each player can only do this action once per round. If you have two stood up meeples on a tile not occupied on resources, they may add a new standing meeple on that tile, which now maxes out your meeples on that tile. Don't forget to increase the total population track by one after doing this. This is the migration action. You can move all of your meeples one tile adjacent to them. If there's water between them, you have to have a ship. Ships can be moved on their tile to the borderline between two tiles to allow transportation between the two tiles for any meeples. Ship transfer includes multiple tiles, so if you have more than one ship, you can chain them to move several meeples as one long movement. You can also choose to move a ship to a new tile before or after your meeples use it, whatever will be most helpful in the situation. When you move a meeple to a new tile, you may immediately use it to engage an unoccupied building tile if you want. Only one meeple can occupy or engage a building at a time. This space is the taxation space. 
Anyone can go here, but there are only three spaces. When you take the action, you gain money for everything you have on the map or control as shown on the right side of your player screen. You'll get to collect money for each of these you control. Meeples, ships, towns, and temples. When you tax, the natives are unhappy about it, so the rebellion increases by one, which is indicated by this icon. Just move the black meeple along one space on its track. One main action is exploration down at the bottom of the action board. When you first take the action, you must place your disc on your colored space. If you take it again, you may place it on one of the multicolored spaces. Doing the explore action, you may move a stood up unengaged meeple to a new adjacent tile. The player can choose to take the map hex on the top of the stack or the one underneath. However, they can't pick up any of the map tiles before choosing to take it. If choosing the second map tile, discard the top one to a discard pile. The new map tile must be placed adjacent to one of your meeples and must touch at least two other map tiles. The map tile must also be placed logically, land to land, water to water, mountain to mountain. One of your available meeples has to move to the new tile. Whenever someone takes the exploration action like this, they gain an exploration token. The back of it has a question mark with all the resources shown. You can use this token to satisfy a balance of the archipelago requirement or a resource requirement in constructing something. Additionally, if you remember, there are three stacks of eight of these we set up at the beginning of the game. Anytime one of these stacks is depleted, all players immediately gain a new action disc that is ready to be used that round. You can gain up to five action discs to use in the game. If you take the construction action, you can build buildings or a ship. On the back side of every player's screen on the left, you'll find the construction costs needed to build different buildings or a ship. You pay the resources shown next to it, as well as the amount of money shown. The ship must be placed in the water on the same tile as one of your active, unengaged meeples. You must place new building tiles on the land in a map tile where you have a meeple already. The port has to be built on the edge of land and water. Every other building must be built on land. It's important to note that one map tile can hold a max of one type of each building. You can't have two of the same building on the same map tile. This is a temple, town, market, and port. Constructing a building engages one of your meeples on the hex tile. You must move one of your standing meeples who is not already engaged onto the new building tile. When you engage the temple, your meeple is protected from the balance of the archipelago phase when meeples must all lay down. Additionally, being on a temple, you may also stand up for free any number of meeples on the same tile that had to lay down. The town building is the most interesting one. If you engage and occupy a town, you get to control everything on the tile. Basically, everyone else has to ask you permission if they want to collect resources on that tile or use any ports or markets there. If somebody was already on a market space and haven't moved off it, they can use the market without your permission. However, if they leave, they must get your permission to move back to it. That's as long as you control the town. Also, if their meeple ever lays down while in the building tile, the owner of the town can kick them out of the building. Also on the action board are these areas in the center. The top area represents the domestic market, and the ships here are in the port. These areas are used when engaging ports and market buildings. You can engage a port or market building once each per round. To engage the port and market tiles, your meeple must be available and on the same map tile. Then move it onto the tile to engage. When you engage a market building tile, pay one florin to trade on the domestic market. Put the one florin paid here on your colored tent in the order to take two buy or sell actions on the domestic market board. If you engage a port, you place the one florin paid on your color ship here. This allows you to do two buy or sell actions on the export market board. The extra benefit here is you're not using an action disc to use the market, only moving a meeple on the map. Engaging the market like this counts as your action for your turn, then play proceeds clockwise. After everyone's done taking actions, you move on to the evolution card purchase phase. Look over at the cards face up on the turn track board. In turn order, you must do one of two things. Either purchase one card and rotate a different card clockwise 90 degrees, or rotate two different cards 90 degrees. The cost of buying a card is shown by the arrow. The number the arrow points at is its current cost. Rotating the cards changes the price, and if the card rotates around enough so that the arrow points at a skull, then that card is discarded from the game. Then immediately move the top card of the deck face up in its place. 
a new top card will be showing after purchasing a card and refilling the card spot, or if a card is discarded by rotating to the skull icon. If the newly revealed top card of the deck has a red background on either the top or bottom, it represents a crisis threat that occurs immediately. You could have multiple threats triggered before your turn is over. For example, this one says to decrease the rebellion track for every temple on the map. There are three types of cards you can purchase. There are progress cards, character cards, and wonders. Wonders have a construction symbol showing on the left. Purchased progress and character evolution cards immediately come into play in front of your screen so other players can see what you have. Money and resources you've collected always stay behind your screen and are secret. Wonder evolution cards are kept in your hand until built. During the actions phase, the player can take a construction action on the action board to pay the construction costs of the wonder card and play that wonder card in front of them. Then remove one of the active non-engaged meeples from the map and place it permanently on the wonder card. Move the population marker down one. Wonder cards will give extra victory points to its owner at the end of the game, one per medal shown. Most evolution cards show this black arrow icon, meaning it must be activated to be used. To use it, you tap the card as an action. Just rotate the card 90 degrees. A card can only be tapped once per round. During the disengagement phase, all tap cards will untap to their upright position to be used again. If there's money showing by the arrow, the player must pay that to the bank when using the card. Some evolution cards have a colored arrow on it. The colored arrow means any player can use this card once it's been purchased. If another player is the one activating it, they must pay the cost shown on the card, plus one additional florin directly to the owner. If there's ever a question about what an action or icon means on any of the cards, refer to the rulebook on page 14 to check the glossary. There's also a card glossary for each card and objective in the game. The game will end one of two different ways. Either the War of Independence happens, or one player's secret end-of-game condition is reached. Throughout the game, there will be different events and actions that can move the Black Meeple on the Rebellion counter. If it ever passes the White Meeple, which is always equal to the total population, then there is a War of Independence. The natives are angry and rebel, which means they win and players lose. If any player's secret objective is to be a separatist, then they are the only winner. Otherwise, players play round after round until one of the endgame triggers is met. When that happens, the game ends at the end of the current player's turn. The game considers all players winners at this point, having avoided the War of Independence. However, one person will be crowned the grand winner after tallying up victory points. To facilitate counting points, flip over the turn track to see the point tracker. Use each player's turn marker now to track their in-game points on it. All players flip their objective cards and calculate everyone's victory points per the victory condition. I recommend starting with the first player and going clockwise, giving everyone points as earned per each objective card. Then score the green trend card that was laid out at the beginning of the game for all to see. Additionally, if anyone built any wonder cards or had special character cards that gain victory points, they gain them now. The person with the most points is the grand winner. In case of a tie, the player with the most money wins. Keep the rulebook handy and check BoardGameGeek.com for FAQs and extra content. Check the video description for links to Top Shelf Gamer for token upgrades and SleeveKings.com for 10% off coupon on card sleeves. Thanks for watching. Like and subscribe if you found this teaching helpful. Stick around to watch another Learn to Play video. And remember, teach when you can, but always be learning. See you next time.